the HouseDog.com Real Estate Show for April 15th. Welcome. Coming up today, home flipping in America has plummeted, plus new Charleston city codes. How will that impact people? More commission lawsuits are going forward, even though there's been a major settlement. And Charleston, population 1.5 million. Is that possible? And if so, when? Plus, home affordability across the nation has tanked. We're going to dive right into this stuff today. Home flipping plummet nationwide. That's a headline article from Riz Media, an industry uh, paper. 2023, 309,000 people flipped a home. It means they bought the house, fixed it up, improved it in some way. Maybe they just got a great deal on it, turned around, and within a few months flipped it and sold it for, in most cases, a profit. Uh, that, however, is a nearly one-third decline from 436,000 people doing it in 2022. Two reasons for this. The interest rates going up have made borrowing money to do these flips more expensive. A lot of people who flip homes and, and use these private money deals or uh, crowdfunding to, to be able to purchase these properties with sort of special financing, and those rates are now 12, 14, 15, even 16%. Whereas they used to be a high rate at about nine or ten percent, so you've got some of the non-qualified mortgage rates now are, are hitting that ten percent mark with interest rates in the high sixes and low sevens. And this week we're off to a rough start in the mortgage business with uh, the bonds market not doing anything favorable for the housing business and the mortgage market as it stands now. Uh, I still think that we'll see a drop in mortgage interest rates, potentially fourth quarter of this year or early next year. Now, let's take that away from a prediction. What really drives those rates down? If inflation stays sub 3%, we just had a report that it was 3.5%. And I'm not talking about what you pay for milk. I'm talking about the inflation index from the government, which has been a lie for decades, but it's still the number being used to determine the inflation. So 3.5% was the latest trending number. That's not the annual number. It's an annualized number. And that was a little bit of a shocker because we thought it would be below 3%. That's not boding well right right now, but this housing market's very resilient. There's a lot of people buying with cash, some estimates upwards of 40%. So that's pr approaching half, at least a third of, of transactions in the Charleston market are people moving into the marketplace and paying cash. We're going to get some into some of the inflow, inflow migration numbers in a bit, and they're just stunning. Now, um, Let's talk about some of the commission lawsuit stuff. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today. I've got a graph I want to show you and a little bit of an update. About a week or two ago, there was a decision we didn't get a chance to report on one of our shows. I think it was during spring break week that a panel of judges in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals overruled a district judge who had said the commission lawsuits at the Department of Justice, so at the federal level, not the people suing that was settled, but the Department of Justice is suing for antitrust reasons, saying that the, the, the National Association of Realtors has violated antitrust guidelines. I, I think they have. Full disclosure, I'm not a realtor. I haven't been one since 2014. I have no plans to be one because I think the Realtors Organization is one of those trade organizations that takes the takes the flow of some unions. Is that not that all unions are bad, but that sometimes what they do is they play to average. And they don't necessarily pick up uh, and, and raise the bar, so to speak, in the industry. Uh, they, in my opinion, have still, in settling this $418 million lawsuit, have attempted to control the market in doing so. And when I say control the market, they still want to set the standard of how different brokers, large companies, and small and real estate agencies actually do transactions. And I think that's problematic because there shouldn't be a trade organization acting like they're the state uh, licensing board or the uh, Federal Housing uh, Authority or HUD or Housing and Urban Development. They're acting like a government agency instead of really what a trade organization is, is a lobbying group with members. And uh, what, what, what's really been the problem with the Realtors Association over the years and the thought process and the culture of it is that it's too involved in setting the tone for how people do their own business. I'm going to do my business my way, morally, ethically, and especially legally correct. And I don't need the trade organization telling me what's right, wrong, or indifferent. 
And this is really, I, I laugh at this stuff here because this is a chart. Uh, let me pull this over here. This is what brokers are considering doing in the $418 million suit to settle the fact that there's no longer commissions being offered in a multiple listing service. So here's what they're saying. They're going to, they're going to train buyers. Like, so we're supposed to train buyers and then they're going to train sellers. So what we're going to do as a group, they're saying is put out a bunch of propaganda, which is basically what they've done for a hundred years. Uh, some brokers, I'm one of them, are going to focus on ancillary services, providing additional value and ultimately reducing the cost of what it cost a buyer to do the transaction. We have a program for first responders, military vets, uh, teachers, uh, people in the uh, uh, you know healthcare industry like nurses um, and, uh, and municipal workers that gives you a big commission rebate. And there's some fees that normally everybody pays in a mortgage that go away. So uh, those are ancillary services that I'm now offering that can offer thousands of dollars in discounts for people in certain categories, which means that maybe I don't make any extra money, but in the face of the commission lawsuits and everything, I make something similar to what I would have made before without having to pass along any costs at all and perhaps even giving some money back to buyers. So getting creative is why I like the chaos this commission lawsuit has created. And so there's a, a, a faction of people, about one in 10 in the brokerage industry, say, you know what, I'm done with NAR. That number was much smaller before all of this. I'm surprised it's not 58%, because frankly, I don't see any value at all, except in lobbying Congress and some things like getting flood insurance renewed, if they'd stay in their lane and do what's important, like keeping the services that homeowners and, and the agents serving them need, then we wouldn't be in this mess to begin with. But I, I digress. Um, I'm going to get to in a minute how to double your income if you already own a property in Charleston and are thinking about converting it into an investment, or if you already own investment properties, how you can double your income from Charleston real estate. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But before we do that, population 1.5 million, Charleston, South Carolina. Could that be possible? Well, let's look at another chart. Let's pull this one up and take a look. This is a chart from, um, I believe, the Charleston Regional Business Journal is where I pulled this. Just shy of 1.5 million population predicted for the Charleston region in the year 2040. Right now, we have approximately 600,000 vehicles daily, you know, registered and on the roads in Charleston. We project that number will not go up at the rate of population, which is a very good thing. But again, that number approaching 800,000 in the next 15 years. So population of Charleston, 1.5 million by 2040. That sounds like a long time, doesn't it? But it's just about 15 years. Right now, as of the last measurement, there were 775,831 people in the Charleston market. We're the 74th largest metro area in the country. When I moved here in 1997, 98, we were numbered like 98. So we are growing three times the rate of the rest of the U.S. population in the Charleston region. I know we all feel it. That's because 28 new people, net inbound new people, are moving to Charleston. That's 28, 28 per day. That's several thousand per year, which means if you take that number and back it up to 2017, we have somewhere now between 850 and 875,000 people in the Charleston area. This is a number, this right here, this chart that you see on your screen, the numbers that I'm looking at in this data report, this is what really indicates to me the future of Charleston housing. Are we building a lot of houses? Yes. Are we building enough houses? No. We're building a lot of, of, of apartment rentals and things of that nature, and it's becoming increasingly more difficult for anyone in the Charleston area who at a household level makes less than $100,000 a year to find and afford a house in the marketplace. So this, this is both a crisis and a, a, a really big boom for housing in the Charleston area. So depending on where you sit in this equation, if you own real estate, investment real estate in Charleston, the prices have become 
extremely outrageous, right? So you have a piece of real estate, might have bought it for $250,000 10 years ago, 15 years ago during the crash. It's now worth six hundred grand. If you're lucky, you might have bought something in the right spot at the right time. You paid two fifty dollars for it. It's worth a million. And you're leasing it for, let's say, even $4,000 a month. The general rule of thumb here prior to COVID was that if you had a $300,000 property, you wanted to be making about 1% per month on the rent. That's gross, not net. So that'd be $3,000. Well, that's, there's almost nothing remaining in the market at $300,000 that's going to do 1% net rent per month, maybe three quarters of a percent. Most likely we're talking about 0.5 to 0.6. So here's my proposition. If we look at these population numbers, the amount of growth here, one could speculate and say, listen, prices of real estate here are going to continue to go up. I've got a property worth half a million dollars, theoretically. I'm renting it right now for $3,500 a month. And in a couple of years, three, four, five years, maybe it's 600000 uh, Maybe the market plummets. Maybe it goes through the roof. More likely it goes up than goes down or sideways. I put those odds at 50% chance it goes way up, you know, double digits, near double digits. Uh, I would put the chances it goes down about 25%. So the risk-reward factor of appreciation uh, in Charleston is pretty good. So just, about, I, again, my theory of owning real estate is maximum cash flow. Cash flow is more predictable as long as the market is growing as it is and continues to grow at a pretty good clip. And I don't think that we have the potential of economic headwinds that will affect the rental rates in our market at the level that it could affect property values if rates went through the roof, not expected, if the uh, economy at large, and then, of course, it fell into the Charleston market. I believe that if you've bought a property in Charleston at the right number, $250,000, let's say, and you owe very little on it, so you've got a gross amount of equity there, and it's worth $700,000. If you think about what you can do with, let's say, five hundred grand net, net, net in your pocket, six hundred, five, six hundred grand after you sell it, pay commissions, everything. And right now you're 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 leasing the seven hundred thousand dollar property for let's say thirty five hundred a month, four grand if you're lucky, right? So you take that property. That's like a 3 4% return on the – not on your money that you invested. I, I don't want to be unfair about that, but on the potential equity that's there. So let's say you did a 1031 tax-free exchange, which means you don't have to pay the taxes by selling the property. You identify a few other properties you're going to buy in a different market, a feeder market of Charleston. So you could go to Columbia, outside of Columbia, somewhere up in uh, Polly's Island of Myrtle Beach where prices aren't quite as high. Or you could go to Greenville where prices aren't quite as high or any part of – parts of Georgia, even Atlanta, some parts of North Florida, inland from the coast, where the prices for what we see here, three bedroom, two bath in Charleston for six or seven hundred thousand might down there be three or four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. Uh, or there might be more multifamily duplexes, quadplexes and such available that produce an eight percent return. So let's say that right now you've got a seven hundred thousand dollar property in Charleston County or Mount Pleasant if you can even find something for 700000 in Mount Pleasant, and you take that money, let's say you walk out with half a million bucks. Right now you're netting uh, twenty grand a year on that $700,000 if you pay taxes and everything. But let's say you take that half a million dollars in equity and you put it somewhere where you can net 8.5%, or let's just say 8%, which can be done in many markets outside of Charleston. So you take Charleston investment money and you move it for cash flow purposes somewhere else, which I can help anyone with. I, I know where those markets are. And you put that money at an 8% net operating income return, half a million dollars. Now you've taken your $20,000 to $25,000 in net Charleston income, same asset, equity, and everything. you got a different asset, still appreciating somewhere, maybe not as much. But the market, but again, we're talking cash flow. What can you do with it now? Because cash flow now is sometimes a lot better than struggling al along with minimal cash flow because it helps you improve your life, spend more time on investing, less time on working for the man. Me, to me, cash flow is king, not speculation on equity. Equity is great as a sidebar uh, or as a. Um, uh, a consequence of owning real estate, and it's certainly been great in Charleston and will continue to be. But if you're thinking about cash flow and retirement and how maximizing your living standard can be, taking that equity and putting it somewhere else for an eight and a half, eight, eight, nine percent return, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year in return, instead of a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar a year return. 
That can be done with the equity you have right now in Charleston by moving the month. And, and we need listings. You sell when the market needs sellers, and we need sellers in Charleston, especially in certain areas. You move that money elsewhere. You're still appreciating, even if not as much, and you've immediately increased your cash flow uh, by quite a few percentage points. My argument is, is that in most cases, if you buy markets that are emerging right now that aren't as mature as Charleston, you'll be able to pick up the loss of appreciation in immediate cash flow, which helps your li living standard and investment and qualifying for mortgages at better rates and buying investment properties, it helps you better now. I'm not saying if you own five rentals here, sell them all. I'm saying you could sell one of them and probably double your cash flow by using the equity from Charleston to go somewhere else. So just a little bit of a thought of how you can take Charleston investment and really increase your cash flow. Let's jump off of that screen. Let's talk about why uh, moving money around in housing and looking for cash flow is important because markets with more home affordability in theory are appreciating. I was driving through Pauly's Island this past weekend for a volleyball tournament for my daughter, and I was looking around at some of the real estate, and, and not like a, looking at it in person, but just a quick drive around. And I'm like, wow, this stuff is a lot cheaper than an hour and a half down the road in Mount Pleasant, but this market's really nice. It's more of a second home vacation market, but more than no more than 30% of the country can afford the average house in the country. It's even worse in Charleston. So 16% of the listings are affordable on the median income. And I would say that number in Charleston is probably down in the 10 to 14% range. I haven't done the exact math. So when you look at where we are at the end of 2023, and it's getting even more unaffordable with the combination of interest rates and a continued increase in prices and values, prices are in, in almost every standard that I've looked at going up in Charleston as we speak at a pretty reasonable clip. So housing is becoming less affordable. So the markets that uh, a lot of people are starting to look at Charleston and go, on my $70,000 fixed income in retirement, I just can't make it work. So there's where's the next markets people are going to go to and create that demand and drive up prices? That's some of the opportunity that if you own real estate in Charleston right now, you have to present inventory to the market that we desperately need and get a really big number for it and then take that cash and reinvest it somewhere where houses are more affordable and the market's inclining perhaps due to higher demand because certain markets like Charleston parts of Florida are becoming less and less affordable these are no longer the cheap markets of the south they used to be all right so um, we've gone through a, a number of these factors here So now let's get to uh, my soapbox issue of the week. I haven't done a lot of soapbox on the new program. No sense in sitting and complaining about City Hall and things we can't change. But I think you should know, if you have a lot of property in the city of Charleston, that they are on the move again. It's called aggressive concept creep, what's happened in Charleston County, the city of Charleston over the last few years. The city's zoning ordinance hasn't, according to them, been updated since 1966. So the code guides how the city develops and grows so it can have a more modern update, as they call it, necessary. Now, I am not against having a better master plan. I've seen other cities do this better than Charleston and particularly Mount Pleasant. There has been this no growth, no growth, no growth mentality. So what's happened with that mentality is there's been no change, no change, no change. And so whatever's been zoned, whatever it is, has been what it is. And then you get this development as opposed to saying, okay, let me give you an example. Is I, for, for instance, there's all this zoning in Mount Pleasant. There's not been a master plan. So we've developed a scenario where I can safely now say that Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, as an example, needs another apartment complex like anybody needs a hole in the head. We, we, we have, we're full. We have enough. Thank you. If we had a master plan that said, this is what we, where we want apartments to be. This is where we want single family development to be. This is where we want green space. This is where we want, I know they'll say, well, Brian, we have a master plan. Not really. We have a plan, but not a master plan. Like for, at what point are we going to widen 41 or we're never going to do it. So we're just not approving any more development, right? You can't just say if we widen 41, it's going to create more development. We have to make a plan in Mount Pleasant, for instance, and say, if we widen 41, great, this is how much development we're going to plan for or not. This should have been done 20 years ago. We shouldn't be sitting here to kind of traffic in certain uh, areas of, 
of uh, Charleston and Mount Pleasant. Highway 61 is another example in West Ashley. As you move up through there, I mean, it, it's there was somebody coming to the office over here in Mount Pleasant that lives up Highway 61, at times taking an hour and a half to get to what took, you know, in, on Sunday afternoon, 25, 30 minutes, maybe 40 tops. So the master plan, I agree with them. We need a better master plan as a city, especially in the areas of Charleston County. I mean, you've got massive growth. D.R. Horton is beginning to build two different neighborhoods with almost 700, if not 800 houses in Ravenel. And those people are going to be working downtown. They're going to be working in North Charleston. And that traffic is going to have to come through existing roadways through the city of Charleston, part of its Ravenel, part of its Charleston County, part of its the city of Charleston, and make their way to the airport, to Boeing, to facilities in North Charleston and downtown and throughout the, the metro area. So they're going to rewrite zoning. The, the problem I have with what I believe to be Charleston County and the city of Charleston zoning, at least as it has been, as it were, is that it's not so much about really planning for growth. It's about taking away the private property rights. I, I don't believe Charleston County, the city of Charleston's um, growth plans are really right for homeowners to begin with as it relates to short-term rentals. I, I just There's a bill floating around the state house here in South Carolina that has been floating around for a long time, and it may float around to, to nothing, that basically outlaws city municipalities like Folly Beach did from just all of a sudden saying no more short-term rentals. Uh, Mount Pleasant has long done it, and they, they started when there was about 700 short-term rentals in Mount Pleasant. They made everybody go get a permit. I have no problem with that. Identify yourself, raise your hand. That way, if you're renting to, to delinquents that are having drunken parties and throwing bottles all over the streets, the homeowner and the tenant can be fined properly for violating existing codes. But the actual restriction of my rights or your rights to rent your property out for a night, a month, a week, or a year, or 10 years, to me is not in the city's purview. It's To me, I don't even know how it's constitutional. Now, I understand if you buy in, say, Dunes West, and you are renting out it. You can't do that. You have to follow the rental guidelines of a homeowners association. And I believe it should be up to the homeowners associations to be the, the arbiter of short-term rentals or lack thereof or promotion thereof. If the HOA says no, it's no. But the city should not be overriding people's private property rights. We've got this huge thing going on out in Folly Beach. Let me pull that up for right now. That says, uh, what is the latest of short-term rentals on Folly? And I'm just giving you kind of an, an instance of people arguing. Everybody's angry at the other side. There's still places to rent if you look. Well, that's not the point. The point is, is that if you own an investment in Folly that you've been living in but plan to turn to a short-term rental, now your value has gone down 10 to 30% depending on where it is. Because there's 1,100 rentals. And I think it's like 600 permits. So... They did. It was so nice they grandfathered everyone in. So for the next decade, it will arguably be nearly impossible to get a short-term rental permit, a new one, on Folly Beach. You've got one already, you're gold, but you sell the property, I think it terminates. I, th I don't think they transfer. And so you've got a lot of people on the other side, and there's Melissa down here says, we're still working on things. Like working on what? You've passed a law that took on a, on a, a well-known – uh, community that that's for rental and vacation and vacation. There's a lot of residents out there too. And I, I understand their plight. There's a lot of people coming short-term rentals. They're not like homeowners. They, they're a little bit sloppy. They're a little bit rowdy. They create a disturbance. It's less, less of a, a, a of a wholesome place to live. But at the same time, if someone owns a property, I don't believe the government should be in the business of telling them whether they can lease it out nightly, weekly, monthly, yearly, et cetera. I just I think that's where the government overreaches. So when I look back at what the city of Charleston is doing, and they're talking about uh, coming up with a new city planning and zoning and ordinance, they're going to start to take people's property that's zoned one way and zone it to this and say, well, now we've determined you're going to do this and you can't do that and what have you. And it then creates this huge disruption in the housing and in the property market that's just not healthy for the owners of property. And it, it makes investment scary. Right now on Folly Beach, it is not attractive to purchase a second home unless you are the random few people, a small subset of the market, who's going to purchase it, keep it, own it, or someone that's going to live in it full time. 
Like you're going to live in its second home, uh, live during the, the winter season here, and you go back up north. That, that, there's still some of that transacting going on, but the people buying saying, I want a second home that I can use for three or four months of the year, and when I'm not using it, I would like to make some revenue leasing it out weekly, which is mo- mostly what they do. Every now and then you get a weekend rental or something like that. Now they can't really subsidize in a meaningful way the property, so guess what they're going to do? Go somewhere else. And so we're seeing some of that happen. Some of that traffic's going to Edisto. Some of it's going out to IOP, although the price point of IOP is pretty high. And, of course, Sullivan's Island long ago outlawed it. But Sullivan's Island did it not as an attack on property owners, but as a a long-term strategy well before the entire real estate market became affected and affected by Short-term rentals, Airbnb, VRBO, and such as that. Sullivan's Island was way before that. So you have a much different residential community created on Sullivan's Island. I think at this point, for a city municipality since about 2010 or 11 to come out and say, well, we've always allowed short-term rentals, but now because we don't like the business model, we're going to tell you what you can and can't do with your property in a way that we never have for the last 100 years. I just think that's wrong. And I think that the ultimate uh, judgment of it will be maybe it'll make Folly a great residential primary and second home, no rental community with a few rentals or whatever in 20 or 30 years from now. But it's going to create a lot of pain for people who own homes there in terms of the value compared to an Edisto or an Isle of Palms that allows it or some other beach location like up at Polly's Island or Myrtle Beach. It's going to make a tra- – I don't like things that make this area less – attractive to invest in and many times our government policy whether it be city zoning changes charleston county planning we're just making it way too difficult for homeowners and property owners to be just that homeowners and property owners that's it for this week we'll give updates on my facebook page be sure to like my facebook page brian crabtree real estate the youtube channel click the like button click on the bell for notifications and if you need something reach out to me brian at housedog.com or hit the contact form on the main page at housedog.com. Have a great week. Thanks for watching.